Good morning, Warriors on a Mission. Good morning, good morning, and good morning. Good to see you all. Good to see you all logging on. And uh, I always like to take a little scroll through the through the feed every now and then before I, I log on. Just see what's going on with everybody. Just to see if uh, anything I need to address or, uh, you know, whatever the case is. But anyway, as I scroll through the day, I saw a lot of happy birthdays and just different things. So every let me know a lot of you all are having a great day. Um, this is the day the Lord has made, and so, I don't know about you, I'm always thankful every time I wake up and, and, I, and I listen around in the house to see if I hear footsteps, let me know everybody's doing good, and, you know, especially after I didn't talk to the Lord and pick up my phone and I don't see any weird messages, I'm always thankful. God is awesome. He's awesome in all that He does, even in situations where things may seem a little confusing, confusing and it may seem like man can I get a break God has everything ordained uh, even with that and you know we've talked in several videos and how God allows things to come our way just to push us closer to him and he does that perfectly it hurts but I don't know if you remember uh, growing up you know when your parents would hey I grew up with whippings uh, I don't know if you remember that they never felt good Anytime you were scold or anytime your parent, you know, took something away to punish you or to get you in line, it never felt good. And so God used the same technique, but better. Nothing against my parents, nothing against your parents, but God is the author of it all, the orchestrator of it all. So, of course, uh, you know, he's better at it. So, but he does everything in line. For us to give him glory, he does everything perfectly, even when seasons of uncomfort, uncomfortability as a word, he still does it to shape us and mold us. And I don't know about you all looking over my life. I thank God for where I'm at, knowing that I'm going to grow more. But I thank God for where I'm at. And I understand that God is going to continue to help me to grow as well as you all. And so I thank God for all of that on this morning. And this morning, God did give me a word, and you know, it was awesome because he woke me up this morning, and if you see the title, um, Our Day is Coming, Malachi, the fourth chapter, one through six, when God woke me up this morning, he showed me Malachi, fourth chapter, and honestly, I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, God, wow, is there a Malachi, fourth chapter? Because all I remember is Malachi, third chapter, I think it's three and ten, where he talks about you know, this is what's quoted in most churches, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that they'll be meeting my house and prove you now here with said the Lord, you know. So talk about money, the tithe. Um, and yes, that is an awesome reminder that um, we need to make sure that God's house has what it needs so that it can be orchestrated out to help the people and to keep the lights and stuff on too. But I was like, God, is that Malachi 4th chapter? And as I begin to dig in my word, to follow along with what God had woke me up telling me, I, I, I began to read Malachi, the fourth chapter, this morning and study it. And as I begin to study it, I see once again, God has given us a warning. And so, once again, I'm thankful because God lets, lets me know that we serve a current God. He's not the God of yesterday. I mean, he was there. He's not the God of just today. But he's also the God of the future. And I don't know about you, but I'm always thankful anytime I can pray to the Lord and he leads me to an answer or he speaks back or whatever the case is, is let me know that he's right there still walking with me, still listening. He's current to my situations. Um, he's right there. He's listening to my heart and he speaks a word back to me. Sometimes it's in. Uh, through others, sometimes it's through nature, sometimes it's through his voice, um, so a lot of times through his word, uh, just, he's, it's a blessing to me, and I don't know about you all, but it's a blessing to me to know that my father, my creator, is not something that died years ago, he's someone that is current, that listens, and answers, so follow me to Malachi, the fourth chapter, one through six, and we're going to as you find that, we're going to go into prayer. We're going to read through this and 
and and and and God willing, we'll discuss it. I don't know if it's gonna be verse by verse. It's up to Him on how He does that. I don't try to dictate because dictating how things go a lot of times will kick the Holy Spirit out. So let us go into prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for yet again another day. Thank you, Father, for my my family. Thank you for my loved ones. Thank you for all of us, God, that are still standing. And representing you to the best of our ability. Father, I'm asking you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit inside of us will strengthen us. Clear out all the confusion, all of the negativity, all of the things, God, that is not pleasing to you. God, show us how we are letting it in. And then show us how to remove it. So, Father, we thank you, God, for the clarity that comes from your word. We thank you, Father, for the peace that comes from your word. We thank you, Father, for the vision that comes from your word. We thank you, God, for your purpose that comes from your word. We thank you for everything, God, that you give us, God, that will allow us to still stand in your graces, that allows us to still stand representing you, Father. Thank you for your anointing, God. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for you. Thank you for all, God, that you're doing. And Lord, we just bless your name, Father. We thank you, even though we don't always like even the crazy times, God. We thank you because those times strengthen our faith in you to let us know that you got us. You got us this time. You got us. You had us in the past and you're going to have us the next time. So, God, thank you for being an awesome, lovingly, loving Father that guide us through obstacles. Thank you, Father. Continue to allow us to rest on you. Teach us more how to rest and teach us how to enjoy even crazy circumstances, knowing that you are in control. Thank you, Father, for it all. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Looking at Malachi, the fourth chapter. This is out of the MacArthur Study Bible. So if you're following in another version, it's going to say some of the same, some of, some, some of the words, you know how that goes when you're looking at different versions. But follow me, Malachi, the fourth chapter, starting at verse 1. It says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch. Verse 2. But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like a stall fed calves. You shall trample the, this is verse 3. You shall trample the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, verse four, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I command him in Horeb for all Israel with the statues and judgments. Verse five, behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Verse six, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. All right. Now, look at verse 1. Going back over verse 1, it says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. And then we're going to stop right there for a moment. Now, looking at the day, the day, that, the day of His coming, you're looking at, you're thinking about a time where God brings His judgment, and although many of the world will say, "Man, hey, I've been hearing this forever. I'm tired of hearing it." Blah blah blah. Cool. If you're tired of hearing it, that's all right. I'm not gonna stop talking about it because I know it's in our future. So you have to understand that God is the the one of the things that stood out to me as I was studying this morning. And this is a beautiful thing that remember in the scripture it says that one day, one day to the Lord is like a thousand years. And so when I think about that, that one day to the Lord is like a thousand years, that is why we can go back centuries and find out that God has said these things long ago. But you have to understand, this is the mercy of God. And this is something that, that 
I don't like I said, I don't know if God gonna take us verse for verse or how he's gonna do it. But this is something that you must remember. God loves us. He sent his son Jesus down here so that all will have everlasting life. So now when you look at the word all, then God's mercy towards us, it does not mean that he's going to forever sit on his hands and say, man, I just, I just got to hold back. I just got to hold it again. God, I, I, God uh, I, 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 well, you know, it would be God because Jesus don't even know. Honestly, Jesus does not know the day that God is going to say, hey, it's time. So God is not going to continue <clears throat> To allow everything to line up and hold back the day of judgment because you and I are not in line yet. That's not what he's going to do. But he has prolonged things because his wish is for all to come back with him. But he understands that all, because he's Alpha and Omega, he knows that all is not going to choose him. But he's not going to consistently let this thing keep just prolonging. Because you got to remember, God hates sin. He loves the sinner. He loves us, but he hates sin. So now let me ask you something. How tolerant are you when you have the power to change something, but you allow people to mistreat you? How tolerant are you? Now remember, we're made in God's image. We're made just like God. So let me ask you once again. How tolerant are you when it's something that you can change? How tolerant are you with people mistreating you? So if you have a short amount of patience, now you can't imagine that God is going to sit back and say, Hey man, I can change this anytime I want to, but I'm going to continue to let them mistreat me. I'm going to continue to let them curse me. I'm going to continue to let them walk away from me. I'm going to continue to let them make me a mockery. Just because of my love for them. If we're made in his image and you and I don't have a whole lot of patience with that. How would you expect God that has total control over everything that goes on. He can change everything at moment twinkling of an eye. How long do you allow? How long you think and expect him to hold back his wrath? So when you understand that, that is the mercy of God that God has allowed us to continue to be here on this day. Then you understand that it says, when it, for behold, the day is coming. The day is coming, burning like an oven. Now, when you think about burning like an oven, an oven is hot. And I'm going to show you what God uses. This, this is a parable. Remember, Jesus always taught in parables. And this is something that you always got to go to the Holy Spirit in to ask the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows now. You got to go to the Holy Spirit to ask you, I mean, to ask the Holy Spirit, what is it that you're really speaking about? Because God, Jesus, just like Jesus taught in parables, the word of God is a lot of times illustrated out in parables. Because God is trying to make sure we understand and see the whole entire picture of what he's saying. He may not be using the exact detail to bring that wrath. Okay, so now when it says, for behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven and all the proud. Yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. Now, if you put stubble on something hot, a stubble is going to burn fast. It's going to burn fast. If you ever made a fire and took some old dead grass or some hay, threw it in there, it burns fast. So guess what? God is saying here in this scripture that his day is coming and those that are outside of him, outside of his will, will be like stubble because he's coming like a burning oven. And it says, and the day which is coming shall burn them up. Now, this is the thing. Along with God's grace and mercy means that he has prolonged things, which means that he's going to he's giving us time to get this thing right. Will you and I ever be perfect? In our own strength? No. But what he is looking for, who has submitted to my son's will? Who has accepted Jesus Christ in their heart? Who is still trying to run it their way and who's trying to do it God's way? God is looking at the heart. So when he's looking at your heart, he knows if he sees Jesus. He knows who's covered under the blood of Jesus because 
without the blood, without accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then he can only see your sin. So when he look at you, he sees sin. But when he looks at those that have accepted Jesus Christ, then he don't see the sin. He sees the blood, which makes us perfect. Not our actions. We're not talking about our actions no more. He's looking at to see, is his blood of his son covering you? And if that is the case, then you have been made perfect according to the blood of Jesus that covers you. I'm not talking about your actions, talking about the blood. So now that is what separates us from being a child of God or what separates us from being part of the world. So when he's looking and says, when he says those that are wicked, he's talking about those that are uncovered under the blood, uncovered and don't have the blood, have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Okay, so now, and it says, at that day which is coming, uh, at that day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. Then it goes at the very end of verse 1. It says, that will leave them neither root nor branch. What does that mean? Well, when you look at a branch, a branch is something that has been elevated from the earth and is extended out. Okay? Now, anything that is vulnerable, if you look at the vulnerability of a branch, which is uncovered, out of the earth, sticking up in the air for all this to see, versus a root that is down below the ground, covered under the dirt. You may know it's there. You may not know it's there. If you're looking for a root or something, you really can't see it and start you, until you start digging. So you would think of a root as being protected. But this is what God says. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. This is the end of verse 1. That will leave them neither root nor branch. So guess what? I remember as a child of God. I mean, I remember as a young child. And I heard about there won't be water but fire next time. As a child, I was in my mind trying to trying to be wise and think like a lot of times the world. Let me let me be honest, because the world a lot of times the world is still thinking that this is irrelevant. Uh, God knows my heart. You know, we think so. We think of things of escape, a way to escape it. OK, so me as a child, I'm starting to try to. Listen to the word of God and trying to make sense as, as the word. And I'm talking like maybe five and six years old. I remember thinking, I'm like, okay, if it's fire, then I can jump in a water and, 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 and the fire won't consume me. And I'm like, dad, well, how am I breathe? Well, I can take a straw and stick it up and I can be able to breathe kind of like snorkeling. You know, and, and so that was my thought process as a five or six year old trying to escape the judgment of God. Not understanding but this is just the thought process. So now God even addresses this when he says that he will leave neither root nor branch. There is no escape. There is no escape. When he's coming back and he's bringing his judgment, there is no escape. You're either covered under the blood or you're going to be destroyed. There is no escape. And see what the world, the, the, what the devil likes to do, he likes to make this as, man, this is the bottom of the totem pole. God, the devil likes to make sure that we get so prioritized with the cares of this world that Jesus and God and salvation and, and the wrath of God, all that stuff is so far at the bottom of your list that one day it's just going to sneak up on you and there's nothing you can do about it. Now he gets to laugh and like, God, I stole a bunch of them from you. But that is why God has his people that are still letting us know the wrath of God is coming. Heaven and hell are the only two locations. And it all depends upon whether you accept Jesus for heaven or reject him and go to hell. There is no other choices. There is no, I can escape this thing. It just don't work that way. God made us. He know how to break us. He know how to get all that taken care of. So anyway, going to verse 2, it says, But to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings and you shall go out and grow fat like stall fed calves. What is verse two talking about? It says, but to you who fear my name, those of us who know the Lord and you understand the power of God, man, I fear God. I fear him. I love him. I know he loves me, but man, I ain't trying to test you at all. 
That's my reverential fear of God is that I know that the only reason I'm still here in the condition that I am in is because the mercy of God. It's nothing I've done. My last name carries no weight. My statue in height carries no weight. My complexion carries no weight. My race, if you want to give and take it to that level, carries no weight. None of that is relevant to God. He made me, he, he, he ordained, he knew everything about me before, me before I got here. None of that carries any weight. So when I think about all of that, and I'm like, man, God, you know my thoughts? You mean to tell me, God, I can't even hide my thoughts from you? You mean to tell me I can't even hide my thoughts from you? Then it lets me know that I can't earn God a uh, 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 love. I can't earn it because nothing about me says I, 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 I'm so good that God, you got to love me. That doesn't work. And so when I look at that and it says about, but to you who fear my name, I fear his name. I fear him because I know that at any moment, if God got sick and tired of my stupidity, my negativity, the dumb stuff, my sin, that even though I'm covered under the blood because I am saved. I love the Lord. I love God. But if he got tired of my mess, he ain't pull the plug. Uh, you're not doing it right. I'm going to get you on out of the way. You're not doing it right. Because to whom much is given, much is required. So the more of the word of God that I know, the more of the word of God, the more the Holy Spirit reveals to me, then I am required to whom much is given, much is required. I'm required to walk it out. I'm required to pass it on. I'm required to walk as a man of God and not as a babe in Christ because God has revealed a lot to me. And so because he has revealed a lot to me, I am walking in fear of him because I know that if I don't do things according to the way his Holy Spirit is telling me, then God has somebody who's praying to be in my in in, in to have the knowledge God has given me. God, I, God has many to step in my. I'm not so important. That's a humility check, and so I fear God because of that. Because I know what He can do. I watch it all the time. So and it says, "But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise." This Son of Righteousness in my in my translation it says S U N. And, but we're talking about S-O-N, Son, Jesus Christ. The Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Now, when we're talking about the healing, the healing that goes to this earth. And I talked about in the last, I think it was, I think it was the last um, video I did. If not, it's recent. Um, anyway, where it talks about the earth groaning with pains that come from sin. The earth, that's what I, and I talked. I don't think it was the last video, but anyway, I talked about it recently talking about tornadoes, hurricanes, and a lot of us will say, Well, no, that's because of the seasons. Well, again, when you look at God, and God has all power and authority over this world, even though He allows certain things to happen, and it looks like the devil did this, He's done it just like with Job. He allows these things to happen to drive us closer to Him, but He also uses us a lot of times to be uh, an example. Of what will happen if we follow Christ or if we don't follow Christ, then you got to remember, and I, I'm taking it to a couple of different levels here. You got to remember, too, that us with a heartbeat is promised that we're leaving. And then you look at the fact that for God, we're going home. Home going is a is a great thing, even though for us that are left behind, it's a we like to it's, it's kind of like we're sad because it's like, man, I'm gonna miss you. For God, it's a little different. And I, you know, I've talked about it in several videos, and I'm kind of going to move past that a little bit. But when you look at the fact that Jesus is coming with healing in his wings, he's coming to not only heal those, to break us, those of us who have been um, dealing with the chaos of this world. See, the more of Christ you got in you, the more you see the chaos. The more you see the rebellion against God, the more you see the stubbornness. You know, God calls those that are stubborn and refuse to do a God's way. He calls them stiff neck. 
And so we start to, you know, when you, the more of the Holy Spirit that you allow to dominate in your life, you see the stiff neckness, the hardness of the people. And it hurts to see people rebel against wisdom of God because God's wisdom is literally like, for us that have kind of submitted more to God's will and his wisdom, it's like you see the clarity in it. It's like it makes so much more sense than anything else. And so when I look at that and I see uh, Jesus bringing healing in the wings, it's like, oh, man, the things is finally going to be back in order. The chaos will subside and, and it'll be done God's way. And so when I see that the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings and you shall go out and grow fat like stall fed calves. Now, a stall fed, and when we looked at the stall fed calves, I was like, why is that relevant? Well, a stall fed calf, a calf that's been like, it talks about like a calf that's been set up in a stable for a long period of time. And of course, you're constantly feeding and they're not getting the exercise that they need. So they are getting fatter and fatter. But they talks about when they, the stable door is finally opened up, that that calf runs out and leaps with joy because he's been released. Well, that's how you and I will be when Jesus Christ comes with healing in his wings. You and I will be so happy that our day of dealing with the chaos and, and walking upright and dealing with the negativity of the world and the craziness and the rejection and the spirit of the Antichrist, the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist being anything that goes against the word of God. We'll be at a point where we're like, wow, thank you, God. Finally, there's going to be some order. So you and I will be, as it talks about, and grow fat like a stall fair calf. You and I will be able to be released out and just the joy of that calf being released. And you've seen them kind of like, if you've ever watched any rodeo, they come out and they're bucking. And But there's going to be strong joy with that. So you and I will be just full of God's joy of the fact that, whew, finally. So anyway, moving to verse three, it says, you shall trample the wicked for there shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Now, remember, we talked about the stubble um, um, in verse one. It says, behold, the day of coming burning like an oven. Now, remember, we was talking about like an oven and then the stubble being placed in the oven. Well, now we're looking at it as uh, the wicked being burned up. And there's ashes. So it says, you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. Hear me. God is, this, this week, as we talked about in verse 1, there is no escape. But there is an easy fix. Yes, no. Yes, I accept Jesus Christ. No, I don't accept it. The nose is the ashes. The nose become the ashes. And it says, again, for they shall be ashes under the souls of those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ. They're going to be ashes under our feet. So on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, there is no escape. Now, here it is. Let's move to verse four. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Now. Looking at this verse, when it talks about the law of Moses, this law of Moses represents the beginning first parts of the uh, of the first covenant, that first covenant of where um, God was beginning to pull the, 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 his children apart, separating us from the world, giving us a different standard, um, something to follow. And the majority of that covenant, you look at the Ten Commandments, was about our obedience. So this was God's first type of separation for the children, you know, children of Israel, the children to be separated from the world. So it says, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in horror before all Israel, the Israelites, with the statutes and judgments. OK, then verse five, behold, I will send Elijah, the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So now you talk, we talked about in four, Moses was the first, like the first covenant of being pulled apart, separated, our walk being different, 
our actions being different, um, our obedience being different. This is the first coming. Then it talks about um, Elijah. Elijah was the one that denounced Baal, Antichrist, uh, those things of worshiping idols. That's what Elijah done. So now here's a different style of covenant where it's like, I want you to put away the things that are Antichrist. Those things that do not represent God. Here, so it's taken a little deeper. And now you got to also looking at that covenant. You got to look at it in a spiritual aspect as well. Because we can sit there and let's be honest. We can say, as they said in the word of God, Lord, Lord. But our heart is far from it. We can go to church every Sunday and be in church and be thinking about other things. We can be in church looking at all the women or looking at all the men. We can be in church doing all sorts of things. And it looks like we're there faithfully and it's all going in. But see, God is looking on the inside. He's looking at our heart. God knows exactly where our heart lines up. So when you look at Elijah talking about the denounce of Baal and you look at us putting away um well, Baal also represents an antichrist or an idol. You and I, this represents another covenant of where we have gone away from the, not gone away, but we've graduated and kind of went to another covenant of where uh, our obedience is, should still be there, which represents Moses. But we also should be walking in Elijah to where now our heart is lining up with God and putting away things of like an antichrist or walking away from things of an idol, walking away from the things of anything that's not of God. And I hope I didn't say anything confusing. If you have, somebody throw a question mark up, anything, or hit me later. However, I will do my best to explain it. So now, this is a powerful verse that we're about to go into. And this is what I believe God sent me this for. This verse for. Verse 6, it says... And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Look at this. In verse 6, God has brought about Moses, as I said before, in verse 4, to show us that covenant. Then he brought about Elijah and John the Baptist. And all of those who bring to brought Jesus to the scene. And what God is saying here in verse 6, it says, And he will turn the hearts of the children. If we were at this day of judgment, this day of judgment, then let's look at this. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. God will bring us back into a place to where he's forefront. He's the number one. He's the number one priority. He's going to turn. The fathers represent. Remember I told you about this before. God is the cover. God is the top. Jesus. God is Jesus cover. Then you talk about the fathers, the husbands. That's Jesus is their covering. The father's covering the wife. And so when you look at the stair step. And so when you start looking at the children's hearts being turned back to the fathers. That means that we'll come back to our rightful place in the Lord. And God began to show me something with this. As I read the comments about that verse. And God began to show me some things about us turning our hearts. And it says here at the end. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Well listen. When we look at this pandemic. And I've said this before. God speaks often about pandemics because of disobedience. And remember I said at the beginning of the video that one day to the Lord is like a thousand years to us. God is striking the earth with a curse with this pandemic. It's this, this listen. And I'm, if you're on to the scientific and you want to say, well, this comes from, you know, the lab or, or whatever, that's, that's fine. But when you think about the fact that God has the ability to have shut that down. God has the ability to shut it down right now. But God uses things to get our attention. And so I want to say, and I've, God has used me to say this before in another verse, in another video. That when it says, lest I come. Let's go back to again, six. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. 
God is saying here that I am looking for the earth, those of us who are still here, to repent. He's looking for us to repent. Let's go back. Though they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Moses was to get us in line with the outward obedience. Elijah was to get us in line with the spirit refusing the bail. All right. So now when you look at now, we're looking at spirit. God is trying to get us to line back up with his word. The body of Christ. And let's be honest. A lot of us ain't doing this thing right. Okay. So he's trying to get us to line back up. To where he's number one priority. He's trying to get us to line up to where our children, remember it says, the hearts of the fathers return to the, the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Meaning that us, the creation, those in the body of Christ will become one with Christ. Once again, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Listen, I said again, this pandemic is a curse. Because our refusal to be obedient, our refusal to repent, our refusal to repent. I'm sorry, it's great, but our true repentance is having godly sorrow and turning from our wicked ways. We can apologize all day, but our refusal to turn is where this curse comes from. And so hear me, we can say all day long, remember I talked about this in another video, God deals with twos, good, bad, saved, not saved, um, tastes great, tastes horrible, it's always two, okay, it's always two, where am I going with this? Well, the world says vaccination will fix the curse, God is saying repentance will fix the curse. I say that again. World says vaccination will fix the curse. God says repentance will fix the curse. Listen, do not be distracted. Yes, we live amongst the world. Do not be distracted about whether we be vaccinated or not be vaccinated. Whatever your choice is, that's on you. I'm telling you, God is not about the vaccination or not vaccination. He's about the repentance in the heart. Don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The spirit has nothing to do with the vaccination. The spirit has something to do with the repentance or acceptance of the heart or acceptance of Jesus Christ. So when the world has an agenda to push, don't be distracted by the agenda of the world. Amen. But understand that just like the spirit and the Antichrist will try to submerge us. With all the cares of the world, so we'll put godly things so far at the bottom of our list that we don't never really get back to it. Understand, God is speaking about repentance. And it says, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. The curse is the pandemic. God is looking for us to repent and turn. Amen. This is where God gave me this. This is why God woke me up and told me Malachi 4th chapter. Amen. I didn't even realize there was a fourth chapter. This is not something that I just chose. God woke me up and told me Malachi fourth chapter. Hear me. God is looking for repentance and turn, turn. And then God will begin to do the things of him where we all will finally get that. Oh, thank you, Father. We're back covered under the blood, the world, not not just us. I'm talking about the world itself. Amen. Listen to this word. This is what God gave me on this morning. I pray that you receive it. This is from the Lord. This is not Tyrese. God gave me this. And so let's go into prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for your word. 
I pray, Father, for those that you have designed to see this Warriors on a mission broadcast, this live, that they will receive from you. God, speak through the Holy Spirit. Do some kind of pricking, whatever it is, to let them know that this is a word from you. Let them receive it or let them know for a fact it is from you so that they will have the, the wise choice, the informed choice that it was you. And so, God, I thank you. God, this is from you. I thank you, God. I thank you, Father, for bringing your word out on today. God, I thank you for those that you have appointed to receive it. I thank you, God, for all that you're doing. Continue to keep us, God, in the right state of you. Continue to keep us cleansed, washed, uh, 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 um, set apart so that you can get the glory out of our life. I thank you, God. Because you have not given up on us, you are still giving us opportunity upon opportunity to line up with your word. And thank you, God, for the behalf of all of us that you have created. Thank you that you have not let your judgment, your wrath take us out yet. Thank you. Amen. I don't know how much of that you caught because when I looked at it, it had paused, but I thank God on today. When I see, when God gives us a message like this, and it lets me know that there is still time. There's still time. There's still time. But we don't know how much time. We don't know how much time. When you talk about the prophet Elijah, as God brought out on today, prophet Elijah was here and gone a long time ago. Long time ago. So even though one, one, one day is like a thousand years, there's been a thousand years. So we don't know how long we got. All I can say is thank you, Lord, that you and I still have the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ, to be covered under the blood. And all I can say to you on this day, if you have not accepted him and you're debating and you're saying to yourself, because listen, a lot of stuff have been passed to us that was not true, even sit, I'm going to say it, even sitting in churches, a lot of information were passed to us that was not true. And it only, you only get the truth when you begin to dig in the word and ask God, what does this mean? Or God will set you under people that you say, wow, I know that's from God. I know that's from God. If you're scratching your head and you're saying, uh, I like them, but I don't know about half the stuff, then maybe they're not from God. But if God is giving you a green light and you're sitting under them and you know that's the word and they're going straight by the word, listen to what God is saying. God has given us the opportunity to set it right. And only thus, only if you have accepted Jesus Christ. And I was listening to uh, uh, Pastor Perry Stone this morning. And he pointed out something once again. Why is Christians persecuted so much? Out of all the religions that are out, why is it that Christians are the ones that are the most hated? You got to look at that thing. Because the world hates righteousness. What is right, according to the word, is hated by the world. You look at it. It's, it's for anybody that is about 25 up probably have noticed some things that's like, wait a minute, I thought that was supposed to have been right, but now you're telling me this is wrong. Look at the word. So why is it that Christians are the most persecuted? Why? It's because the world hates righteousness. They hate when we're doing things right. We've been taught that from, look at Miss Goody Two Shoes, from we was child, a little child. I'm 42. I've been hearing that stuff like that when I was young. So Miss Goody Two Shoes, or look at that nerd. You, you mean I'm a nerd? I'm looked at negative uh, as a negative state because I'm making good grades? Hmm, what kind of sense does that make? So now you got to look at that. So anyway, all I'm saying to you on this day, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ, this has been a promise that our time is ending. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ and, and really have not done it, accepting like, like I really need you as a savior. I really need you then this is your opportunity to get it right. It's simple. I am a sinner. If you can confess and say, I am a sinner without the blood of Jesus covering me. And you realize this because I said at the beginning of the video that if God looks at you and you have not accepted Jesus Christ and his Jesus blood is not covering you, you are a sinner. It's simple. That's how God looks at it. This is it. But once you say, I, I realize I'm a sinner, I need Jesus. 
I'm asking Jesus to come on the inside. I need the Holy Spirit on the inside so I can be covered under the blood. If you can say that, then you are saved. You are now covered under the blood. So when God looks at you, he does not see your sinful actions. He sees the blood of his son covering you. Now, once you've accepted Jesus Christ, then you start working out this, this sanctification part. Then God begins to show you things that just don't line up no more. And he, the Holy Spirit is showing you things like, man, you know, uh, 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 you know, drinking is really not the best for you. You know, drinking that much is really not the best for you. Smoking a pack a day is really not the best for you. And he began to wing you off certain things. And that's why some people get it confused that well, if I go into the body, uh, if, I, if I accept Jesus, man, I got to stop everything. I got to stop. Listen, God begins to show you things that's not best for you. But being saved is a yes or no. Being covered under the blood is a yes or no question. Then he begins to try to give you life on the inside and show you things, decisions that we're making that are not best for us. That's what the sanctification part starts. Amen. There are two different things. Salvation makes you safe. Sanctification makes you wiser. Amen. That's all. Makes you cleaner on the inside. Makes you live a little longer. Makes you happier. Makes you joyful. So I'm saying this on today. Please make that decision. It's life changing. It's life altering. And I promise you, no, all your situations will not stop. But what happened is you will walk in joy and in peace as you go through your situations and your circumstances. Because now you're no longer dependent on you to fix it. You can now depend on God, the Holy Spirit, to lead you in how to fix your situation. Sometimes he'll lead you A, B, C, and D. Sometimes he'll tell you just rest. I'll get it. But the Holy Spirit will lead you from the inside. But it all starts with you accepting Jesus Christ and being saved. Amen. So anyway, to close this out, I'm thankful for you all. I'm thankful for the word of God for today. Prayerfully, you got something out of it. I pray that you will continue in your fight to be true representations of Jesus Christ. You don't know the amount of people that watches you and, and, and sees Jesus on the inside of you. So I'm saying to you, continue. Although sometimes it feels like you're alone, you're not. You're not. God has us to God has us to, to, uh, excuse me, strategically placed according to his will for us. He has us in certain places, certain on, on I used to wonder and I'm about to close out. I used to wonder, God, why was I born right here? Why was I born this year? Why was I born this month? My parents tried for a year to get me. Why was I not born in 1978, but was born in 1979? Why, God? Because God had me placed in a certain appointed place around a certain appointed people that he had designed for the light of Jesus Christ to shine across. That is why you are in the family you were born in, why you were born, your date, your time, your month, because he has a certain appointed time for you a, to be around a certain appointed people so that you can influence godly. Amen. So I love you all. God's willing. I'll see you on Tuesday. War is on a mission. Let's keep pushing. Let's keep doing things to represent Christ. Amen. I love y'all and I'll catch you on Tuesday. God's willing. Amen. <laughs>